Hello everybody, good afternoon. Sorry we're a little bit late. I'm Alison from Stop Size Well C. We decided to do another live broadcast now that EDF's application has been accepted for examination by the Planning Inspectorate. Many of you and we called for it to be rejected and the councils were very disparaging about EDF's consultations but sadly the bar EDF had to overcome was very low so although the application has been accepted is disappointing it's not a surprise. On the positive side, at least the details are now in the, out in the open and we strongly believe there are issues within the application that will cause serious problems for EDS. So this afternoon, Charles is going to share a few headline facts we've gathered from the application already. Paul will update you on the process and key dates and then I'll come back to touch on some of the bigger picture issues and as ever, what you can do. So we'll keep those presentations brief and if you've got questions, please write them in the comments section on Facebook and we'll answer as many as we can live on this video. Over to you, Charles. Thanks, Ali. Um, yeah, so there's an enormous amount of material that uh, EDF have presented, some 56,000 pages. So uh, we're working our way as best we can through those, but the devil is in the detail. And it may well be that we spot stuff uh, as we go along that we hadn't noticed before. So I'm just going to give you a few headlines uh, from what we've seen so far. The, um, the cost of uh, size or C has now gone up to 20 billion pounds. Uh, to set that in context, back in 2012, they were talking about 6 billion. Now, these are eye-watering lumps of money, but um, it would probably put size or C as the second biggest, sorry, the second most expensive thing on the surface of the earth after Hinkley Point. Um, EDF is planning to start building in 2022 uh, and be fully operational in 2034. If they are, that means that they will, in, and they run to time, that'll be the first time that one of these projects has run to time in Europe. Um, I won't bore you with the, uh, the details of some of the others. Um, as far as climate change, which is a big issue government and and for many of us of course is that the carbon dioxide that size will see uh, is supposedly saved it's not actually going to start repaying that for another six years after it's built because of all the co2 that's going to be consumed it's going to be emitted during construction so not until 2040 at best will it be worthwhile from a co2 point of view um, a lot of numbers have moved in the wrong direction from our point of view. The first is that the, uh, they've added another 2,000 workers on the site, now up to 7,900, of which nearly 6,000 are going to need accommodation in this area. So therefore you've got 2,000 who are going to be locals. Well, that's their definition of local, but they what they classify it as is people who are commuting from up to 90 minutes away, which essentially means the most of East Anglia and Essex, if you if you draw that on the map, uh, are going to be essentially locals driving in uh, along the A12 and across country. Um, and then there's a, another 600 workers that they're going to need to employ in what they're calling the associated developments. In other words, stuff that's not on site, like the uh, accommodation camp, the uh, park and rides, uh, link road, and so on. And they think they're gonna be locals, but uh, it's hard to see that they can source those locally, to be perfectly honest. There's gonna be a lot of skill skills needed. And where all these uh, workers gonna live, um, they, uh, as you know, probably the, the, the so-called campus or work camp or temporary accommodation uh, is going to house 2,400 workers next to East Bridge and 600 on a caravan site on the edge of Leyston, which leaves, um, under their estimation, the following. 1200 in private rental. So that's going to have a big effect on the private rental market in the area. 800 in tourist accommodation. So um, 
that uh, we reckon that's somewhere in the region of a third or two fifths of the tourist accommodation that's available in the area. And another 880 are assumed will buy houses um, off the local market. So, um, well, there's all sorts of ramifications from all of that. I won't, I won't go into it, but read into it what you like. Traffic is another area where uh, the numbers have crept up. Um, we now know that at peak, they're proposing to have uh, 1,140 truck journeys. That's half, half in, half out um, a day. Um, 700 buses and 700 light vehicles, vans and so on. Um, and those would be moving up and down the link road not to mention over 10,000 cars coming uh, to the park and rides and, in, and some onto the site. Um, the uh, net effect of that is um, the, the rush hour, seven to nine in the morning, you can be getting 71 trucks arriving per hour and some of those leaving, but mostly arriving at that point. So it's going to be noisy and busy and polluting. They've also talked about what they call the early years, which is approximately the first couple of years, um, which is the period when they're going to be using the current B1122 through Middleton Moor and Theberton and, and the edge of Yoxford. Um, and even there, now talking 740 trucks per day and 43 per hour in the rush hours. So, um, you know, it, that I think is probably many of us going to be the biggest impact of all. Um, the associated developers I mentioned earlier, um, all the plans and maps and so on we poured over and they they haven't moved much from we had already known about from the stages three and four of the consultation, but we are finding small changes in the junctions and alignments and so on and those could indeed create important and significant issues for particular people near those places and as we dig them out so we'll be talking um, moving on uh, to coastal erosion that's you've probably seen much of that has been in the news uh, I'm not going to go into detail but there's still the jury's very much out over um, the expert knowledge uh, about how the construction will affect coastal erosion and to what extent coastal erosion undermines in possibly in the literal sense EDF's plans. We do know that the RSPB, Suffolk Wildlife Trust and others are going to be pouring over the documents looking at the environmental effects that it's going to bring. Um, we also know that the, our, two, our county district councils are not impressed at all about how the consultation went um, though what effect that can have here on um, remains to be seen so that's all from me uh thank you over to paul hi um so we now know the dates of the next formal stage of the process called section 56 the public consultation it will start on the 8th of july and it will run until the 30th of September. This period isn't really a consultation in the way that EDF's four stages of consultation were supposed to be. It's our opportunity to identify all of the issues within the development consent order application that need scrutinizing in the public examination later in the year and in early 2021. The first step is to examine the proposals in detail and Charles has given you some of the highlights that we already know about. They are already on the Planning Inspectorate website and from the 8th of July will be available on the EDF website. Once we have examined the proposals and come to our, rec once we examine the pro and come to our various conclusions, we can register as an interested party by listing those items that concern us through a relevant representation submission on the Planning Inspectorate size or C website. There's no need to submit your representation until you are good and ready 
so long as you do so before the 30th of September. There is no prize for being first and there is no penalty for being last. All representations are implicitly regarded as equal, although, as they say, vexatious submissions will be ignored. So we need to keep it factual and based on the DCO content. EDF is making plans to send a mobile library around the area, but we are very unclear about sanitization procedures and access protocols, such as how people can collaborate when trying to examine the 636 documents associated with the DCO. EDF also says it is available at their office for appointments and that they can provide laptops and USB drives to people who are shielding who are, or who have little or no internet. We are sure many of you are finding it hard to read the materials online. If you are, please drop us an email explaining your difficulties as it's helpful to gather as much evidence as possible as to how this uh, entire process is proceeding. Although no action is needed until September, we are keen to involve as many people in the coming weeks in examining the DCO documents, so if you can help, Messages, messages on info at stopsizewallc.org. Our intention by the end of August is to have compiled a fairly definitive list of issues and concerns that we can share with you, with guidance on how to register as an interested party and submit your statements of relevant representation by the end of September. We hope as many of you as possible will do this. It shows the breadth of concern about the project and the issues you raise help the examining authority define the scope of their inquiry. PIN's guidance statement for relevant representations is that they should be of 500 words or less. Later in the process, you can submit more detailed documents to the, examinator, the examiners which support your representation. We may also ask you to support our own re relevant representation submission or those of other NGOs such as the RSPB, Suffolk Wildlife Trust concerning environmental impacts. In early September, we will arrange more interactions with you. Depending on social distancing rules, this might even be a public meeting, but if that's not possible, we can arrange a series of surgeries, probably online, but possibly some in person in small groups where we can talk in more detail about the proposals. Given what we know about the deadline for this next stage, we would expect preliminary hearings in November and public examinations to run between January and May next year. <clears throat> this will be the time when we will marshal all our detailed arguments about the unsuitability of the project for this sensitive area. We will keep you posted on what we find out about this part of the process. Um, and could, let me start again. We will keep you posted on what we find out about how this social distancing is still in place. But we are strongly public pushing the fact that size will see is totally unsuitable for a virtual examination or even a hybrid of digital and face-to-face -face, as some elected representatives have suggested. The planning inspectorate might make their recommendation to the Secretary of State in August 2021 with a decision on the development consent taken by the government in the November of 2021. But in these strange times, anything is possible. Back to you, Ali. Thank you, Paul. Um, before I talk about what you can do, I want to briefly just touch on what's happening in the wider world, which has implications for Sizewell. Uh, one of the things you'll no doubt be aware of is the Prime Minister's Build, Build, Build speech on Tuesday. Now the focus on that was really on housing, schools, roads and other smaller scale projects. But EDF is definitely promoting size we'll see as being shovel ready, despite the small inconvenience of not having development consent for it for another almost 18 months and possibly never. Um, EDF's biggest obstacle, however, remains funding. Uh, we understand there's no imminent decision likely on the regulated asset base or what we call the nuclear tax. And we feel that government will be reluctant to add to the financial burden of households um, at this time. However, we're going to keep a very vigilant eye on the Chancellor's economic update, which is expected next Wednesday. 
An energy white paper and other policy statements um, have also been talked of as due. They've been delayed by Brexit, elections, reshuffles, and obviously now by COVID. Um, and again, we understand from conversations that those are not expected imminently either. The China controversy has far from gone away. Um, last week, the US Defense Department issued a list of 20 Chinese companies with ties to the military, uh, which included China General Nuclear. And yesterday, Shadow Foreign Secretary Lisa Nandy called for China to be banned from the UK's nuclear projects. And to add to EDF's woes, the company is facing a possible hefty fine after being accused by French regulators of misleading investors about the financing arrangements for Hinkley Point. Uh, but meanwhile, EDF has announced it has an interest in building more EPR reactors at Moorside in Cumbria. And it is worth noting that EDF's consortium that's looking at Moorside does not involve China General Nuclear. So I'm sure there's a lot more we could say because um, there is a, a wealth of news um, that's relevant to Sizewell. But let's move on to what you can do. Um, as Paul has said, we would really love more volunteer help to um, work through EDF's application with us. Uh, as they've said, it runs to 56,000 pages. We're also liaising with parish councils and other NGOs and campaign groups to share the load, but all offers of help are much appreciated. We've got some guidance on what it involves and how to go about it. So do contact us by email, info at stopsignswillc.org if you would like to join the team. Secondly, if you are a Suffolk resident watching this, we request you to urgently write to your county councillor, urging them to support a motion to oppose Sizewell C that's been tabled by the Green, Lib Dem and Independent Group of Councillors and will be considered at the County Council's meeting next Thursday, the 9th of July. And if you want to know how to do this, details and the text of the motion and who to write to are all on our website at stopsizewillc.org action. Thirdly, as we always ask, please help us spread the word to build support. We post daily updates on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn and Instagram. So if you can share those posts, uh, we'd be really, really grateful. If you get our email updates, please forward them to friends and family. If you don't get those updates, you can sign up on our website, look for the opportunity to join. Um, and in the coming weeks, we'll be distributing a leaflet within the Suffolk Coastal constituency. So do look out for it. And if you're already a supporter, perhaps consider passing that on to someone who isn't. We have some great posters and banners. I'm just uh, wondering if I can show you those. Uh, an example like this. We're going, to, uh, we're going to get some more of those banners printed up. So if you live on a main road and you've got somewhere prominent to display it, please let us know in the comments below or by email. Finally, and sadly, fighting the size of the application uh, does cost money. So if you are able to give, we're always incredibly grateful for donations. There are a number of ways that you can do so and all the information can be found via the orange donate button on our website, stopsizewillc.org. Many of you have already given very generously and so we thank you for that with all of our hearts. Um, I think that's probably enough on terms of the information we're sharing and I'm just going to see if we've got any questions. Um, I had, there was one that was sent by email from, well, I had a couple by email actually, from people who weren't able to join uh, the live broadcast now. So uh, I'm going to direct this one at Paul. Um, if all the areas that we include in our statements of relevant representation are the same, do we all get the chance to talk about those issues? How, how on earth does that work if we all talk about the same thing? So Paul, I'm going to hand to you. Yeah. Hello. Um, yes. The way this works is that the, the, um, you're all able to provide that information, but then the planning inspector will attempt to put together those uh, groups or people who have common themes or common issues that they want to discuss. And they will suggest that um, you appoint a spokesman or a group who will talk to that issue. If you still believe that you have something which is unique in your view, uh, of, a, of a particular subject that can still be talked about and you are able to say so. There will be quite a lot of email and electronic uh, communications going on about this but you will actually you can get the opportunity to talk about it 
but the chances are uh, you will be, uh, they will try to ask you to work with some of the other groups and get a common theme going. That's one of the reasons why we're already working with some of the other NGO groups to try and make sure that we understand from each other what our, uh, our points are going to be and therefore how best to nominate a group to actually deal with a particular issue. Thank you. Um, and uh, amongst the other email questions we had was one about what is happening with EDS plans to deliver some of the materials by sea. Uh, Charles, how about you? Thanks. Um, yeah, the um, it's a good question. The, the original thought was that they were going to try and build a jetty um, off the um, off. Uh, size or sea, but um, for various reasons, not least the fact that it's such a shifting piece of ground and also for environmental reasons, that has disappeared. Um, what they are going to have is what's called a beach landing facility and that's going to take up a chunk of the beach in front of the site. It essentially means that you won't be able to walk along the beach for about 10 years. Um, and that will sort of landing craft way, in a landing craft kind of a way, land big, big lumps of kit that simply can't be moved by road. Um, in total, they're talking about 40% of the material for the site coming by rail or by sea. But when you look at the numbers, we're still having difficulty making that all add up. But the, it certainly looks to us like uh, a whole lot of the material is coming by road. Uh, we know the scale of the road transport. Um, and um, yeah, as we dig down in, into more detail, hopefully we'll be able to get to the bottom of it all. Thank you. Um, I've got a comment uh, on Facebook from Anne Westover saying, please urge all parish councils to send representatives to the meeting with the joint local authorities group which is planned for the 29th um, of July and um, that meeting has to be done digitally I mean this is one of the huge challenges of dealing with EDF's application at this time um, but if you are in touch if you are a parish council representative or town council representative or you are in touch with them please do encourage them to take part in that um, it's extremely important um, one more question that came by email, which I think probably I can deal with, uh, related to uh, reading reports about valve problems at the nuclear new build in Finland. Um, yes, this is a, a problem that has been found at Olkiliotu with some uh, safety valves that have malfunctioned. Uh, that project is very far from being completed and it's already a decade late. Uh, but one of the things that's interesting about it is that we we think, and we're trying to find out, that the valves that were used in the Taishan plant in China, um, which is the only working EPR, the only working EPR reactors anywhere in the world, uh, use the same valves. So uh, we're waiting for the Office of Nuclear Regulation to come back and tell us what the French and Chinese regulators say about this. But uh, you know, really, the, it just kind of shows that the record of the EPRs. Um, is not uh, is not a good one at all. Um, anything that uh, is supposed to be a twin of what uh, EDF are planning to build at Sizewell and are already building it at uh, Hinkley Point is uh, is concerning. Um, just checking if we've got any more questions. Um, I'm seeing messages, lovely messages and feedback on Facebook saying thank you for all the work we're doing. People are asking for the Zoom link for the uh, for the parish councils meeting. People are saying that they are going to be sending more emails, so that's great to hear. Um, but I think since we're nearly at the half hour, we might um, uh, call a halt at that point and, and wrap up. You can continue posting your questions on Facebook and we will answer them all in writing if we haven't been able to do so live during this broadcast. And please uh, don't hesitate to contact us at any time uh, by email. Um, either or sending a message on Facebook and our email address just one more time is info at size.org. 
And I just want to finish by repeating what Paul said, um, which is that we do very much want to keep engaging with you and sharing with you information about what is in EDF's application. If public meetings are still impossible in September, and let's face it, that's very likely, uh, then we will, we promise, arrange some more digital get-togethers. Possibly we might be able to do some small face-to-face -face group get-togethers um, to discuss the application in more detail. So over the course of the next few weeks, there, there aren't any really urgent deadlines that you need to worry about. Uh, but if you are looking at the EDS application and you want to be part of a coordinated effort to explore uh, all of those issues, then we would love to hear from you. And we will certainly give you plenty of notice when the time comes to apply to be a registered party, register to be an interested party and to submit your statements. In the meantime, thanks to uh, Charles and Paul for joining us this afternoon and thanks to all of you for listening and for your continued support. Thank you. Goodbye.